Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Corgan, and on behalf of the Workland School of Education, welcome to What Makes Teens Tick. Today's session is being recorded in Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Guyana First Nations, as well as the Sutana First Nations and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspa, and Wesley's First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinstis, which we now call the City of Calgary. So I've had the pleasure of working with both Dr. Frank McMaster and Dr. Gabrielle Wilcox, who will be speaking today. I did my Master's of Science in Medical Sciences with Dr. McMaster, and we did research at the Alberta Children's Hospital investigating child and adolescent brain development through neuroimaging. And now I'm currently working with Dr. Wilcox in the School and Applied Child Psychology program at the University of Calgary. And we're working on a project that is teaching teachers about cognitive neuroscience. So Dr. Frank McMaster is an associate professor in psychiatry and pediatrics, and he does a lot of really interesting neuroimaging research at the Alberta Children's Hospital. His research focuses on neurodevelopmental disorders and mental health in child and adolescents. So welcome, Frank. And we have Dr. Gabrielle Wilcox, who is an associate professor in the School and Child Psychology program in the Workland School of Education. And she does a lot of really cool research on educational neuroscience, adolescent mental health, and research on transition periods from high school to university for adolescents. And both of them have their own teenagers at home, so they have a lot of firsthand experience. Welcome, Gabrielle. And so today, uh, they will be talking to us about uh, how the adolescent brain works. And afterwards, we're gonna have a few common questions that they will answer after the presentation. All right, Frank, over to you. Thank you, Kim, for that great introduction. Um, and one of the best parts of the job of working at the University of Calgary is getting to work with bright young minds like Kim's uh, to help people uh, who are coming up who are gonna go on to do such great things. Um, Gabby and I are very excited to talk to you today about what makes teens tick. And as you heard, we're both proud parents of teenagers. And um, so we've been where you are, and so we can talk about it from all those different angles. So first, just to be clear, uh, for disclosures, we neither of us have any industry support uh, to talk about. We do have federal and provincial research support and also support from various foundations to help uh, pay for our work. So whenever I do this talk and, 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 and talk to people about brain development in kids and teenagers especially, I always like to say there's going to be a practical application of the neuroscience you're going to learn today. So uh, I'm just going to set this up and I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. So. Keep in mind that you're gonna learn something you can actually use out of this. So we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, teenage brain development. And I'm gonna hand this over now to, to Gabby. All right, so people sometimes act as if teenagers being problematic is new to this generation. So I just wanna go through history a little bit and see how people have viewed teenagers throughout time. So this is a quote from Socrates. He said, the children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their household. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs and tyrannize over their teachers. Next slide. <laughs> a little bit later, we have the bard here, and in The Winter's Tale, one of the characters says, I would that there were no age between 10 and 23, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancestry, stealing, and fighting. And then moving on to somebody a little bit more contemporary, we have good old Mark Twain here, and he has both the perspective of what it felt like when he was a teenager 
and when he was an adult. So when he was a teenager, he said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was ignorant. I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished by how much he'd learned in seven years. At the same time, when he was an adult, he viewed teenagers quite differently. And he said, when a boy turns 13, put him in a barrel and feed him through the knot hole. When he turns 16, plug up the hole. Next. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help but laugh at that one. I see, I always like this take from a, a scientist named Martin Lind. Uh, as babies, they're adorable. When they start to mature and hit puberty, they just hate everybody and everything. They just destroy everything. Well, what they were actually talking about were adolescent wombats. So this is something that kind of goes across species, uh, you know, where people have expressed a lot of frustration uh, about kind of the growing pains that go through those teenage years. All right, so basically from Socrates to Shakespeare, everybody loves to hate teenagers. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about why we really shouldn't hate them and why the things that they do while they don't make sense to adults really are adaptive and make sense when we understand their brain development. So recently, neuroscience scientists have started to give teens some good press. So these are just a couple of the neuroscientists who really focus on adolescent development and have helped us to understand why teens are the way they are. Now, uh, uh, I have to say at least two of those neuroscientists have actually been in my car. So if anybody's interested in purchasing a 2004 Toyota Corolla that's in really good shape that is hosted, multiple famous neuroscientists did it. You know, I can offer you a good deal. So I'm going to dive in and I'm going to kind of set you up for some of the really important stuff Gabby's going to cover. I'm going to set you up by talking a bit more about like the, the physiology aspects of brain development. And really with brain development, there's kind of four main principles that you want to keep in mind. You know, the brain development is not linear and uniform. It's not like a straight line. Uh, the brain gets more connected and specialized as you get older. And there's a balance between key parts of the brain that really affect how you behave. And there's also a double-edged sword uh, in brain development for kind of learning, but also vulnerability. And we'll dive into each of these things really quick. So first up, to know that brain development is not linear. And it's not like, you know, you start as a little baby and you grow up tall to be an adult. Um, it's not a straight line at all. Like here you've got different uh, aspects of brain development shown on, the, on these graphs. And, you know, at the bottom, it's the age, in, you know, for uh, at the bottom of each of those graphs. And you can see it's not really a straight line for any of these different brain measures from gray matter density to energy metabolism to synaptic density, how those neurons, talk, brain cells talk to each other. You know, it's not straight lines. And even for each different region of the brain, it can vary quite a bit as well. So we really have a bit of a moving target when it comes to brain development. And if you look at this slide, uh, this is data from people who were scanned with MRI scans multiple times over the course of uh, their brain development. And it goes from there about seven years old to about 18 years old and the change in color is the change in structure in the brain. And you can kind of see that it's not uniform and it's not really so much of a straight line, how the brain changes as you get older. And indeed, there's one key part, see the little red circle? That one little key, oh, one little key part that if you look at that, that's part of the brain that actually doesn't really finish its structural development so you're about 25 years of age. So brain development takes a lot longer than people originally thought. It's not like you turn 18 and poof, you're an instant adult and you know, everything's all good. Your brain's actually still undergoing quite a lot of changes. Now your brain also gets more connected and specialized as you get older. And if you look at kind of how the, the number of brain cells that you have, how well they're connected to each other so, so they can talk to each other, you actually overproduce a lot of your brain cells and brain connections. So if you've got like a 10-year-old girl at home or an 11-year-old boy at home, 
they have way more brain, connect, brain cell connections than you do as an adult. And if they're anything like my kids were at that age, they're very, very smug about that. Um, but really, as they get older, they start to get rid of those connections that they're not using. And that elimination process is called pruning. And it's a key part of brain development. And really, you're, as an adult right now listening to this, you're losing brain cells right now. So there goes one. There goes another one. Oh, you just lost another one. Oh, there goes another one. And, but don't get too worried. Uh, you've got over 100 billion brain cells in your head. Uh, about equal to the number of stars in the galaxy. And there's even some new evidence talking about how you can grow new ones and especially new connections. Uh, but really it's that job of adolescence to get rid of those connections that you don't use and keep the ones that you do. So not only are you kind of working on which connections you're going to keep, how fast those connections work together changes quite a bit. There's a coding that goes on to brain cells that helps them conduct faster because it's all electricity. And that's called myelin. And the effects of myelin really aren't subtle they can in increase the transmission speed of a brain cell by about a hundred fold. So as you get older, you're getting rid of those connections you don't need, but you're also speeding up the connections you do have. So you're even better at doing certain tasks and doing certain things. And like I said about how brain development goes a lot longer than you think, well, the same is true for that myelin development in your brain. There's even one, uh, uh, one key pathway that goes from the front part of your brain to one of some of the more emotional portions of your brain called the uncinate fasciculus. We like really weird names in brain biology. It's what we do. Uh, and that part of the brain doesn't actually finish or hit its peak developmentally till you're in your mid thirties. So you have these key brain development things that go on a lot longer than we thought. You know, uh, and so that even what is a teen brain, that definition has expanded quite a bit, just even over the past five years. And when you think about that brain, how it gets more connected, more specialized, starts to talk to each other, uh, uh, you know, inside each brain region talking to the other, there's no like one single part of your brain that does all of one thing. There's no single part of your brain that makes you love chocolate or cheer for the stampeders or God forbid the Eskimos, um, you know, there's, they all work in unison and work together, uh, heavy on teamwork and interaction to get those different jobs done. So how your brain works uh, really counts on how each different part of the brain, which remember all aging at different rates, how they all work together to get the job done. So this is, there's a lot of shifting sands that we have to deal with. And there's some neat data that came out of the, the United States from this guy, Philip Shaw's lab, where he looked at brain development in people with high intelligence and superior intelligence and looked at them compared to people with average intelligence. And I know there's a lot of really neat, complicated graphs on here, but kind of the key point from all these graphs is that for the people with high intelligence and especially the people with superior intelligence, their period of brain development takes even longer than what it does in people of average intelligence. So that ability of your brain to learn things and learn things so quickly, which is, this is stuff that, that, that Gabby's going to get into that, you know, that ability to learn and master different things so quickly that that happens in developing brains. A lot of that is that physical, Plasticity, we call it, changeability of the brain that really allows it to be a learning machine. There's also a really important balance between prefrontal and limbic regions that affect behavior. And so those are kind of, you know, anatomical terms, but to really put it into, um, you know, ways that, that, that are more understandable, the prefrontal cortex, that front part of your brain, that, that's kind of like the boss of the brain that's in charge of everything. And how that part of the brain develops in relation to the other parts is very key for behavior. So if that prefrontal cortex, that front part of your brain, the thing that is like the executive, the frontal executive we like to call it, 
everything that makes you a viable adult, you know, comes out of what this uh, uh, very large brain region tends to do. Um, your ability to stay on task, to focus, to plan ahead, to understand consequences, um, to stop yourself from doing something. Uh, this is all your that prefrontal cortex, that boss of the brain. And if that part's not really in charge yet in a developing teen brain, which parts are? Kind of begs that question, right? Well, there's two key parts, the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. And if you look at your thumbnail, that is about the same size as your nucleus accumbens inside your brain. And that plays a key role in reward processing. It helps arrange, okay, is this good? Do I want more? Is this bad? Do I want less? And if you look at this slide, the blue crosshairs are showing you kids looking at high reward, high fat, high sugar foods. And you can see that reward part of the brain coming online, that little spot right in the crosshairs that is going, oh, this is great. We want more of this. This is good. And then if you look at the, the, the green crosshairs, the, the other side of the slide, that's showing the nucleus accumbens getting activated in response uh, to alcohol-related stimuli and alcoholics. So that sense of reward, whether it's something you know typical like food, uh, alcohol, sex, social interaction, all these things, uh, is me uh, partially mediated by this one little part of the brain that connects to all the other parts that help to tell it what to do in those situations. And without that boss of the brain telling you what to do, you can be a bit more reactive to that sort of thing. And even your amygdala, another key part of the brain, it's about the size and shape of an almond. Uh, and that's involved with processing emotional reactions. Kind of, is it good or bad? Uh, what level of arousal should you feel? Is this exciting? Is this calming? And, you know, so if uh, uh, you're a teenager doing something new and exciting and you're taking a big risk, you know, that, that's your amygdala saying, this is so much fun, this is so exciting, and your nucleus accumbens going, yeah, this is really rewarding, let's do this. So from a biological point of view, your teen brain really is that kind of, it's learning that balance between reward and arousal and being in control. And that takes place over many, many years. And you, know, you wouldn't want to be one of those people who's totally devoid of emotion, who doesn't feel anything, um, but you also wouldn't want to be one of those people who's totally ruled by pleasure. But for the teen brain, you know, without that boss in front, it really is that Nike slogan, you know, just do it. Just, you know, but actually just the do it part um, out of the whole thing that, you know, kind of that spurs them on to do stuff. So the last brain principle we're going to talk about for the, the physical aspects of brain development is that there really is a double-edged sword of plasticity and vulnerability. So that your brain can be a learning machine, as you're going to hear about, but it also can put you at risk for different, different things. And your brain really is uniquely yours. There's some neat data. This is data from a study of identical twins uh, scanned over many years, so from childhood through to the age of 18. And the difference in color you're going to see in this brain is showing you how their brains end up looking more and more different over time. So these are twins who were raised together. Like It's not like one was raised in a loving home and the other one was raised on a deserted island um, you know, <laughs> after a plane crash or something terrible. Uh, these are kids raised in the same environment, going to the same school together, all that sort of important stuff. And even then, as they get older, the changes in their brain starts to change and make them different from each other. So even in situations where you have identical DNA to someone else, if you got an identical twin, your brain is uniquely yours based on your experience in your life. And that's a really key thing to kind of remember out of all this. And 
that fact really kind of opens up that questions of vulnerability for good, for bad, all that sort of stuff. That, you know, if your brain can really be influenced by the environment, well, then what happens when bad things happen? Trauma, mental illness, things like that. Uh, there's a, a fellow I, I work with uh, named uh, John March out of Duke University, really brilliant researcher in uh, the field of obsessive compulsive disorder. And he said this quote uh, once, and I really liked it, and how it's bad for the brain to be mentally ill. The brain grows by learning. And if you're mentally ill, what your brain learns is mental illness. And you know that exposure that happens over development, uh, you can really pick up and change your behavior based on these things. So it can have lifelong impacts. But it's not just for bad stuff like mental illness, there's actually good stuff too. This is data showing brain structure differences between uh, kids who did very extensive music lessons and kids who did not. So the kids who did, you know, uh, picked up an instrument and really got to a good level of mastery with it, they had structural physical changes in their brain as a result of that. And it's not just the music geeks, of which I was probably one in high school. Um, it's also the jocks as well. Uh, playing on organized sports has a very similar effect on brain development, where it physically changes the structure. So one of the things I always tell teachers, you know, especially if there's any teachers in the audience today, but teachers and parents really are kind of brain mechanics you're really influencing the physical changes of their brain, how they're gonna turn out and how it's gonna function as they get older. So we really hit those four principles of brain development, that it's not linear, that as you get older, your brain gets more connected, more specialized. There is a balance between brain regions that affect behavior. Like, so if there's, if the boss part of the brain isn't there, it's kind of like the parents are away and the kids can have a bit of a party on the weekend, um, and then also that double-edged sword that your brain is really great at learning, but it's also really great at learning. And that can be for good and for bad. And so I did promise you a practical application of, uh, uh, of, of neuroscience. And so this is actual data uh, from our phone data usage. Um, from our, our family cell phone plan that we have. And you can see that there's four of us on the plan at that time. And uh, my wife and my adult son were really good about managing how much data they use on their phones. But I knew my teenager was not going to be quite as good at, at monitoring their behavior about how much data they were using. And especially, as Gabby's going to talk about, when it comes to social reward in teenagers, and social is what kids use the phones for, uh, I knew that it was going to be too big of a temptation. So they actually ended up using quite a bit of data over the course of the year. And so I really restricted how much I used because I didn't want to pay extra. So, you know, the guy who knows neuroscience, uh, you know, found a way to try to game the system a little bit, um, you know, so we wouldn't have to pay extra in bills because I just knew that that teenager was gonna be a little bit more irresponsible than usual. So how can we learn about brain development? Just really quickly, you know, there's not a lot of post-mortem data that we can rely on. You know, we can't dissect a lot of brains, obviously. Uh, this is a picture from last Christmas. No, just kidding. Um, this, you know, there's not a lot of post-mortem data for doing this kind of work. We really rely on magnetic resonance imaging. And what imaging allows us to do is to gain that window into the living human brain at a level that we couldn't do before. And brain imaging has only really kind of come into its own just over the past maybe 20 years. But in kids, it's really only started to come into its own over the past 10 years for helping us understand how the, 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 the brain works and develops and changes in young people. And it allows us to look at a whole host of, of uh, you know, different things um, from brain structure, uh, brain function. This is someone 
This little part of the brain lighting up is just someone tapping their fingers together, very simply. And we can look at more complex things like how kids do math, how kids recognize emotions and how that changes with development. Um, it's really interesting to get kids to do math in the scanner though. That's like a whole fascinating field all, all by itself. We can look at brain chemistry, you know, how different uh, aspects of metabolism, cell building blocks, neurotransmitters even, how, how those change over time. We can look at how different parts of the brain connect to each other and talk to each other, which really comes in handy. And so some common questions we get about brain imaging, you know, obviously, does it hurt? Can it read my mind? Uh, no. Uh, does anything touch or poke me? Nope. Do, do you need to get any needles? Typically not for research type scans. Can I sleep? It's a great place to grab a nap. Um, is it radiation? It's non-ionizing radiation, which means you could get an MRI scan every day of your life for the rest of your life and you'd be fine. Nothing's going to happen to you. Uh, the last question is kind of an evil trick we used to play on people where we tell them that because they were in a giant magnet for an hour that they would stick to their car or their fridge if they got too close to anything big and metal, um, you know, which is just kind of an evil jerk prank we used to play on, on people. But really, it's very safe. Um, it's uh, allowed us to really break down the barriers. And indeed, Without research, we wouldn't be able to make progress in mental illness, learning disabilities, neurodevelopmental disorders. You know, research really is fundamental to all this. And it's not just a bunch of mad scientists. It really is very tightly regulated and controlled. Everything has to go into rigorous ethics examinations for what we're doing, rigorous scientific review to make sure we're doing the right thing. You know, so it really is something that's very closely monitored. So if you do get the opportunity to participate in research, know that your rights are always protected and uh, that you're helping make progress, you know, for learning more about all kinds of things from healthy brain development, you know, to mental illness, neurodevelopmental disorders, everything. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the good, the bad, and the ugly of teenagers. So in the good part, Teens are learning machines. So as Frank alluded to, that plasticity that teenage brains have really helped them to learn um, in a way that they haven't ever learned before. So if you think about the kinds of schoolwork that elementary and middle school students do compared to high school students, at that age, students are all of a sudden able to reason abstractly so that they can do more complex work. They also engage in more critical thinking. Right? So they can engage in serious social studies debates. They develop their own opinions. So you may have interesting conversations around differing political views now with your teenagers that you wouldn't have had before because they didn't have those critical thinking skills. And they're very good at hypothetical thinking. So they often want to know, what if we did things differently? And they often kind of push adults on thinking differently about how things happen. All right, so this really extremely helpful, efficient learning is fantastic for academic work, but there are, it comes with a lot of inefficiencies. So teens tend to be quite inefficient at attention, self-discipline, task completion, and emotions. So you can see that this probably, uh, their efficiencies are probably some of the things that cause conflict between teachers and teenagers and parents and teenagers because we really see them as being these efficient learning machines. And so it really doesn't make sense to us sometimes when we see these other aspects of their functioning that are really inefficient. All right, so looking into the bad, teens are excessive risk takers. Zitz is one of my favorite cartoons. I think that they do a fantastic job of capturing adolescence. So you can see here that he says, so dad, you know how sometimes something seems like a really good idea and turns out not to be such a good idea? I think this is the essence of teenage risk taking. So these are just some examples of some of the things that have been in the media in the past years about the, the risks that teenagers take. And when Frank and I did this in a junior high school, we talked about how Teenagers know that these are stupid and that all the kids are like, yeah, 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 but they do them anyway. And so we asked if they knew anybody who did some of these and 
most hands went up and some kids even yelled out, I did some of them, right? So they understand that these things are dangerous, but they do them anyway. So we'll talk a little bit later about how we can have this juxtaposition of cognitively understanding risks, but engaging in them anyway. First, as Frank also alluded to earlier, human teens aren't the only risk takers. So all mammal adolescents engage in risk taking. So a few examples here are mice who tend to drink more alcohol when they're with their peers than when they're alone. Thompson gazelles, who instead of running away and hiding from lions and tigers, stalk them themselves. And again, this highlights a little bit of the adaptiveness. So at that point, if they do this effectively, they've gained really important information about lions and tigers that they can use later to avoid them more effectively. And the last one is only males. Male otters uh, swim through what's known as the triangle of death that's filled with great white sharks and parasites. So again, we are not alone in having teens who engage in risk taking. So risk taking can be adaptive and helpful. So for example, it encourages teens to kind of move away from their families and to find a mate somewhere else rather than in their small, small family circle. This is helpful because we know that in places where people stay in the same area and they don't have genetic variation, they tend to have a lot more disorders and, and problems. So really leaving and taking those risks to move on helps to increase genetic variation and the health of humans as a species. It also helps us to survive as a species through challenging times. So for example, when really bad things happen in the world, teens tend to be the ones who take the dangerous trips to leave, to find new places to start new lives. So the example here is the Irish potato famine. And it wasn't like all of the 40 year old people who decided to leave to go to Canada to start a new life. It tended to be the teenagers who did it. And that ended up being really beneficial for them to continue their bloodline. Additionally, not all risk is bad. There's lots of really healthy risk taking that kids can engage in. Um, some examples is participating in class, performing in plays or musicals, trying out for sports, um, engaging in activities like um, rock climbing there, getting a job. All of those things are risk taking, but they're really healthy types of risk taking. So we don't want to encourage our students never to take risks, but we want to encourage them to kind of put that risk taking into more beneficial venues. So there's always asking then too about teens and risky behaviors with drugs and alcohol. So just talking a little bit about some of the negative impacts and how drugs and alcohol um, kind of work together with, with risk taking behaviors. So alcohol really interferes with making new memories, which really isn't great for teenagers who are trying to learn lots of new things. And as anybody knows who's been around people who are drunk, it, it decreases inhibition, so they're more likely to engage in other risky behaviors if they're consuming alcohol. Nicotine, long-term nicotine use is correlated with lower IQs, so that's not good, it makes you stupid. Um, it also makes it harder to engage in rational decision-making and is a risk factor for alcohol abuse. So smoking and alcohol often go hand in hand. And then finally, cannabis, which is even more in the forefront as it's legal for adults to use in Canada. Um, but there is increased risky behavior, especially in adolescents. So adolescent brains, again, because they're so plastic and developing so quickly, they're at greater risk for things that can happen with cannabis. Cannabis use before the age of 18 is particularly harmful. Um, and there's an increased use of schizophrenia for individuals who smoke cannabis. So again, probably something best left for adulthood rather than adolescence. All right, so why do teens do these stupid things? So they are sensation seeking machines, as we said, they are created at a time when really that's what they're looking for is some sensation seeking. They also don't do a very good job of learning from their mistakes. So in one study, there was a card game and teens were not skilled in learning to avoid punishment in this card game. So adults and kids, the researcher would say, hey, if you do this action, you're gonna have a punishment from it. And so adults and children both stopped doing that action. 
but teenagers didn't stop doing that action. So I think this speaks to the way we often approach things. We often do the scare tactics and things. If you do this, all these bad things are gonna happen. And that doesn't really influence teen behavior all of that much. We need to rethink how we approach them. And this is because they get more reward from the risk than adults do. So getting the potential positive that maybe your nucleus accumbens will be rewarded is more important to their brains than avoiding the risk. And when they're with peers, they're much more likely to engage in risky behaviors than when they're by themselves. All right, so as Frank talked about as well, the brain develops typically from the back to the front. So they are underdeveloped in that area that provides some steering. So teens are often described as having a fully functioning accelerator and really poor steering. So that frontal um, area really helps with going, oh, let's move this way instead of running into the tree. And, it, and that part of their brain isn't working very well. So again, to summarize, teens do stupid things because they're sensation-seeking machines. They're looking for those high intensity sensations. They have difficulty learning from their mistakes and they are really, really seeking out those positive rewards. So the risks really don't outweigh the possible benefits. So if we go back to thinking about um, the slide with all of those challenges like the Tide Pod Challenge and the Kylie Jenner Challenge, this is why they still do those things because they know the risks, but they could be the next YouTube sensation, right? And so that possibility of reward is weighs more heavily than the possibility of risk. Additionally, teen brains are uniquely social. There was one experiment where um, teenagers were in an MRI scanner and they were told when the red light comes on that somebody their age was watching them. And so the parts of their brains that were activated were these emotional parts going, oh my gosh, somebody is like looking at me. And if we think about this, teens think that people are looking at them all the time, even when nobody's looking at them. And so this really impacts some of the decision-making as well. So their brains process the social information differently from adults. Additionally, feeling social I socially isolated causes more significant distress in teens than in adults. So while, you know, if you're not getting along with coworkers at work, it's not fun for an, uh, an adult, but you're able to manage that okay. For teens, this um, is exacerbated by the way their brains process that information. And this shows um, the results of a study where they were looking at teens driving behavior. So it was a video game driving behavior. And you can see that um, there's the gray bars and that's when they did it alone. So in this one, they're driving along and there are these lights and they get more points if they go through the course faster, but they get um, penalized significantly if they get in crashes. So are they gonna take the risk of going through a yellow light that might turn red or not? And you can see that when they're by themselves, teens are not very likely to engage in that risky behavior. But when there's a group of teens around them, you can see that their um, possibility of engaging in that risky behavior skyrockets. So teens are really impacted and, and engaging in increased risky behavior when other teens are with them. All right, finally, moving on to the ugly. First, in this area of stress and mental health, want to highlight that stress and mental health are not the same thing. Stress in small amounts is good for us, right? If we weren't worried at all about doing well on a test, we would never study and we wouldn't work hard. So small amounts of stress are good and beneficial, but if we have too much stress and it's chronic, that can lead to mental health problems. And teenage years are filled with all kinds of new stressors. So as we talked about earlier, academic work becomes exponentially hard in high school. Friend relationships become really complicated. So people who used to be your best friend all of a sudden don't want to hang out with you anymore. They start to enter the world of dating, which is really complicated and hard to navigate. And they're trying to gain autonomy, autonomy from their parents, but still wanting their parents to be there. So all of these things make uh, teenage years really stressful. And teenagers, that double-edged sword, are at increased risk for mental health problems. 
This graph shows the number of people who have a mental health disorder who are diagnosed before the age of 18. So you can see that 70% of all adults with a mental health disorder were diagnosed with that disorder before they graduated from high school. And this really speaks to the importance of high school as a place to support positive mental health and to have early intervention for students. So if we think about a typical kind of classroom, and this classroom may be on the small side, but you can see here that about five kids in that classroom have mental health disorders, and many of them have more than one mental health disorder. Further, there are lots of these kids who don't have a mental health diagnosis, but who have some symptoms that are distressing. So there's lots of kids who are really struggling in high school, so it's important for teachers to be aware of this and to provide um, adequate support so that students can access their education. And having mental health problems in school relates to lots of other problems. So they're more likely to experience bullying. They're less likely to finish school and they're more likely to have uh, lower levels of achievement. They're more likely to miss school a lot, sometimes from truancy, but sometimes because their mental health sim symptoms interfere with their ability to go to school. And these kids who need relationships the most tend to engage in behaviors that make their relationships poorer with their peers and their family. It's also really important to talk about how media impacts mental health. So when the movie, the show 13 Reasons came out, a study found that after that, suicide attempts increased significantly. So this was a show about suicide. And so kids are really impacted and influenced by what they're viewing. So it's important as parents and teachers to talk about media, to talk about the things that are out there with mental health and to give them more nuanced views of them rather than letting the media tell them what mental health is. Additionally, 20% of teens who are cyberbullied think about suicide. So again, this is an area that is impacted a lot in schools, but it's not directly in school. So it's really challenging for school administrators and teachers to monitor this and know what's going on but it does have significant negative impacts on kids. Finally, just thinking about social media in general, there's lots of research around how this creates unrealistic personas. So we tend to curate what we put on social media to make it look like we have these beautiful lives. And so then when you look at everybody else's beautiful life and you know that your life doesn't look like that, you have this unrealistic comparison. Additionally, people now are so connected with social media and their cell phones that teens actually experience anxiety and withdrawal symptoms if they are expected to be without their cell phone for a day. So how can you support teens to stay mentally healthy? So there are some basic things that all human bodies need that we can do. So eating well, exercising, being outdoors in the sunshine and nature, and getting adequate sleep are all really important for positive mental health. We can also encourage teens to invest in their friendships, to make sure that they have adults that they can trust. And sometimes parents aren't the best always if they're struggling with something. So making sure that your kids have other adults that they can talk to as well, whether it's a coach or a youth group leader or a teacher, it's important that they have an adult that they feel like they can trust. And looking for ways to help others. So helping teenagers look outside of themselves and give to other people as another way to help them to be emotionally healthy. All right, so also when we think about anxiety or fear, this is another thing that people tend to think is being negative or bad, but it's not. It's really healthy and adaptive. So for example, if you're hiking in Kananaskis and you see a bear, having a fear response is really adaptive and helpful. However, if you get those same kinds of feelings when you're about to go up and give a presentation, that's not very helpful, right? So you're having this huge fear response for something that you're not going to die from ends up being unhelpful. Additionally, we often then try to avoid those uncomfortable situations. And then we tell ourselves, ah, I didn't have those uncomfortable feelings and experiences because I didn't go and do public speaking. And then that makes you avoid it again and again. So we really need to change those thoughts that aren't helpful so that we can change our behaviors and do things that we need to do in life. So 
This shows how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected. So if we think that I'm going to die if I give a public presentation, then we're going to feel very anxious and our behavior is going to be to avoid it. But we can actually change our thoughts to change those behaviors. So here's a common kind of thinking error for uh, adolescents. I know I failed that test. I bet I will fail the whole class. I won't pass grade eight, and then I'll have to drop out of school and live in my parents' basement forever. So this is what we call catastrophic thinking. This one bad thing is going to completely ruin my life. And so that's not really very helpful. It's, there are other ways that we can think about the same situation. So if we're going into a test and we did study, we can say, I know that I studied hard and I'm prepared for this test, which will help us to calm down and make us more likely that we'll remember all the things we studied for. However, I know that there are times when students don't actually study for the test, and so that's not a realistic thought. But even with that, you can have a more realistic thought that helps you move forward. So you could say, I don't think that I studied enough for that test and earned a poor mark. I will ask my teacher for help, and I will set aside more time to study for the next test so that I'm prepared. So it still acknowledges that maybe that wasn't going to turn out the way that we wanted, but I have control over this. I can change it and I can make it better. So those were all things really related to more um, supporting typically developing kids. But if kids are struggling, if you think they may have a mental health problem, there are uh, places that you can go for help. One, I think it's important for parents to be available for teens. So while they are removing themselves from you as they are growing up, you are still one of their key contacts. So making sure that you're available, that you're open to hearing their struggles and not being judgmental about it is very helpful for them. Making sure that they can go to their teachers, because teachers often know other resources that will help them. You can also schedule appointments with psychologists and physicians who can help you navigate the mental health challenges that your kids are going through. So in summary, the good, adolescents are learning machines. They are fantastic at learning all kinds of things, and that really helps them to become adults. The bad is that unhealthy risk-taking is common and can lead to some really bad outcomes for them. And the ugly is that stress is a real issue for teens and that mental health problems um, are common. So it's important to support them through this time and to encourage them to get help when they need it. So thank you, Gabrielle and Frank, for everything that you shared with us today. I think it was a really great introduction into adolescent brain development and how it influences teen behavior. So now we're going to move to a Q&A, and I'm going to ask you some of the frequently asked questions from the community. Okay, so the first question I have is, do parents need to be regulating teens' behavior in regard to things like screen time or sleep patterns? And are these things impacting their brain development in ways that they need to worry about? I'll take that one first. So I think that in younger kids, parents definitely need to set limits and really be uh, the controller of what's happening with screen and sleep. For adolescents, I think you need to have a little bit more negotiation. So helping them to determine what's appropriate and working together to set up some things because teenagers tend to revolt against parents just coming in and saying this is the way that it will be. And I think it's important to teach them how to negotiate these things, right? So eventually they're going to be with spouses and people in their jobs where they need to negotiate things. So helping them to gain those skills is really important. I think actually one of the neat kind of side stories with the whole pandemic and lockdown that we've been going through was that uh, a lot of depression symptoms and anxiety symptoms that teenagers tend to express actually went down a little bit as their sleep improved because they were doing a lot of more homeschooling and getting a bit more sleep than usual. And you know, the, the need for sleep is really important when teenager sleep changes quite a bit. And um, there's not a lot of early bird teenagers out there. And that's physiology. That's not, you know, they're trying to be extra lazy or anything like that. It's they really do need that sleep. Nice. Thank you. So for the second question, how important is socializing for a teen's development? So particularly in these times when there's a lot of social distancing going on, 
Is this something that a parent should be addressing with their children? I think, I mean, given the fact that social reward is so primary, is I think it actually should be something that parents should be going out of their way to actually encourage kids to find alternative ways to connect with their, with their friends, with their peers. Um, you know, the, whether it's online gaming together, even a Zoom chat, socially distance chat in the backyard, whatever, you know, to, just to really encourage that because that isolation can really creep in really quickly and teenagers will feel that even more acutely uh, than adults. Yeah, and thinking about their risk behavior too. So I know in the spring, uh, so again, having teenagers, I kind of hear what other teenagers are doing and they would all sneak out at night, right? And still go get together. So uh, unless you're doing something proactively for them to help them get that kind of interaction, they're gonna go and find it on their own. Yep. Nice, so our third question is, how do I know whether my teen is struggling with mental health issues or if they're just being like a grumpy moody teenager? Like, are there telltale signs that you can kind of help to identify this? I mean, I think part of it is the, how significant the changes are for that kid, right? Yeah. So if you have a kid who normally talks all of the time and all of a sudden is in their room all of the time, that would be something that you would start to have some concerns about. So significant changes in how they're eating, how they're sleeping, how they're interacting with other people, I think would be some of the, the main things that you would be looking for. Yeah, and even for things like, like depression specifically, like if they're just not finding happiness and fun in the things that they, they used to like to do, you know, uh, that's another kind of warning sign to go, okay, we've got to talk about this, we've got to look a little bit deeper. Nice, I think those are really important things to keep in mind. So for our next question, what role does nutrition play in a teen's brain development? If you don't eat, you're not gonna have a brain. <laughs> um, but really, I, I, I get any part of the body, your brain needs healthy food. Um, a strict diet of Doritos and Pop-Tarts is not great for your brain function. Uh, your brain is an energy hog. It's 2% of your body weight, but it uses a massive amount of the energy in your body, like a quarter. Like it really, really sucks it up. So you really have to make sure you're getting good food, good building blocks, uh, you know, that, that, that are in there to, to help them function and grow effectively. And actually, too, I mean, one of the other side questions we get a lot with that is like, you know, does sugar make kids act out and be bad? And no, uh, <laughs> it's not. It's not the sugar's fault. <laughs> you know, um, you, you gotta you gotta start to think other things might be behind the behavioral issues. So finally, do you have any advice for parents on when to step in and help their teen with problems and when to kind of like step back and let the teen resolve the issue for themselves? Yeah, I think a lot of that has to be with open communication with your kids. So having times when you can have these conversations. So I know lots of parents find like uh, driving in the car or engaging in some activity really helps teens to talk to them. So the more you have that open communication, the more you'll be able to, one, negotiate, right? So the kids go, no, I wanna handle this on my own and able to work through that and notice when things really aren't right. But if you let your teen just spend 20 hours of the day in their bedroom, right? Then you're not gonna really know what's going on and they're not gonna see you as being somebody who's safe to talk to. So again, trying to, remove your judgment for a little bit when teens tell you things that you don't want to hear as a parent, which is really, yeah. really hard, right? But it's important that you're somebody that they feel like they can talk to. And it's, it's like Gabby was saying earlier in her part of the talk about how a lot of stresses for them are actually really good because how you navigate those, how you succeed, you know, uh, the great life lessons you know, for, for a lot of teenagers. I think it's, it's when 
things start to look like it's, you know, that the, it's a bit more uncontrolled and that a bad end is much more likely, you know, uh, but you have to have that communication. And that tip about, yeah, chatting on a drive, get way more out of my kids with even a simple drive to the grocery store than trying to sit across from the kitchen table and going, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where they feel interrogated. Um, a little drive, they can open up in ways, it, it, you know, or a hike in the park, that kind, of, that kind of stuff, huge for communication. Our mind is being willing to stay up later, right? So my kids want to talk at 10, 30 or 11. Yep. Which I, I'd rather go to bed, but because <laughs> that's when they, they, they're starting to think about things and they, they come and talk to us. See, that's that teenage sleep, sleep cycle. <laughs> Right. So having open communication and kind of fostering an environment where they feel comfortable to come and tell you things and talk to you about things. Yeah. Was there anything else that the two of you wanted to add before we wrap up? No, I think we covered everything pretty good. Um, I really like Gabby's comment about how teenagers get a bit more opinionated. And I always feel that when they start to get really opinionated, that makes them moving out of the house a little bit easier. <laughs> As a parent, it's my little side comment. Well, I just wanted to thank you both so much for being here today and presenting because I think this is really important information for anybody that has teenagers or works with teenagers and will definitely be useful in the future. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for having us. If you enjoyed this presentation and you wanted to learn more about teenagers or other presentations that we might have, you can visit our website at www.workland.ucalgary.ca to learn more about the research that's being conducted at the Workland School of Education.